Okay, then I can share my slides. Okay, so I hope that you guys are able to see my slides uh, properly. Let me also pull up the chat box so that I can look at your questions. Um, spin list is over here. Okay. All right. Uh, let's get started with our lecture uh, today. We are going to be talking about orthogonal bases. So, um, if you have a, a set of vectors that form a basis for a subspace, our goal for today is going to be to form an orthogonal basis for a given set of vectors in a subspace, right? So, we want those basis vectors to be orthogonal with each other. Uh, so let's try to uh, come up with a way, way how we can construct that orthogonal basis. So for that, the first thing that we are going to need to talk about is what are orthogonal vectors? And this is going to be pretty simple. It's going to be computing the dot product of two vectors. So suppose that you have two vectors, u and v, and they are both in the Euclidean space r to the n. So you can assume that, so some, some, something like this, right? You have uh, u is u1, u2, so on, un, and similarly for v, you have v1, v2, so on, up to vn, right? They're both belonging to r to the n, and they're going to be considered orthogonal to each other if their dot product, which is u transpose multiplied by v, goes to a zero. So all you're looking for is the dot product, which means that you're looking for whether u1 v1 plus u2 v2 well let me just write it in a compact manner so i'll just say summation uh let's see n or i can use k k goes from 1 to n uh uk vk should go to zero right u1 v1 plus u2 v2 so on up to u and vn should all go to zero so you're multiplying these products here and you're looking for whether they go to zero or not, right? So if they go to zero, then they are going to be considered to be orthogonal with each other. So it's like projecting one vector onto the other vector, and there should be no projection there if they're orthogonal. So something like X and Y axis, right? So if you project the vertical axis onto the horizontal axis, you get nothing, zero. And similarly, if you project the X axis onto the Y axis, you get nothing. Um, which means that the x and y axis are perpendicular to each other so and they would be considered orthogonal so in two dimensions or three dimensions the, it's it, it, the way we are used to uh, sort of uh, looking at things geometrically it's going to be the same way as saying the vectors are perpendicular to each other so let's take two examples here of u and v there are two vectors u and v and we are going to quickly check whether they are orthogonal or not so for that, all we are going to need to is to find the dot product of these two vectors. So if I multiply here this with this, and then this with this, and I add all of those multiplication results, I get the dot product. So what is that going to be? It's going to give me negative six plus five plus zero plus one. Uh, is that is equal to zero or not? And uh, it is equal to zero, right? So if, because it is equal to zero, you can say that uh, u and v are orthogonal to each other. Or orthogonal vectors. Um, and notice over here, they are both in R to the 4 space. Uh, next, two vectors are not orthogonal to each other if their dot product is not equal to 0. So we have over here two vectors, we just uh, went from r to the 4 to r to the 5. We just added uh, one more element here in each vector. Let's take a look at the dot product in this case. So you've got negative 6 plus 5 minus 4 plus 1 plus uh, 6. Uh, so this guy cancels out with this. And then you have 6 minus 4, which is negative 2. And clearly it is not equal to 0. So you can say that it is uh, not orthogonal. U and B are not orthogonal. vectors right just check their dot product if it goes to zero orthogonal if it doesn't then they are not orthogonal to each other so th that's orthogonal vectors right now what we are trying to do here is 
we are trying the vectors in our basis to be orthogonal with each other. So we are going to, well, obviously we are not just going to have two vectors in any basis. A basis can be, I can have uh, any number of basis vectors. So next, what you are going to need is to define an orthogonal set of vectors because they can be more than two. So a set of vectors, and in this case, we are using S as the set of vectors. It has R vectors, V1 through Vr, and they all belong to R to the N. They are a subset in R to the N, is an orthogonal set of vectors. It is going to be cons considered an orthogonal set of vectors if each pair of distinct, they should be distinct, distinct vectors in this set is orthogonal. So you should be able to take any vector and try to find the dot product with any other vector in the set and it should give you a zero. Not, it, not with itself, but all the others, right? So let's take a look at an example over here. We have a set in which we have three vectors and they all belong to R to the four and let us check whether they are an orthogonal set or not. So to check this, what we are going to need is this. Need uh, u, v, and w are my vectors. So if I take the dot product of u and v, that should go to zero. And if I take the dot product of u and w, that should go to zero. And if I take the dot product of v and w, that should also go to zero. Um, and you can see that in this case, you do u transpose v or you do v transpose u, it is going to give you the same result. Uh, just because the answer over here is a scalar, right? And it's just multiplication here, 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 here. In the other one, you're doing this with this, this with this, this with this, this with this, and you're adding up all those results. Um, and so you need this. And you can check this later on and it will satisfy for all these three criteria, u is, uh, orthogonal to V, U is orthogonal to W, and V is orthogonal to W as well. So we can quickly check one of them. So let's check uh, uh, V and W, right? So what is going to be uh, the dot product over there? So we are trying to find out whether V transpose W, does that give you a zero or not, right? So let's check check that. Uh, so what we can do is we can just multiply negative 2 times 0 plus 1 times 1 plus 0 times 1 plus 1 times 1. Uh, you have got what? Uh, 0, 1. Hold on. There should be a typo here. There is a negative 1 there somewhere. That went to 0. That went to 0. Uh, there should be a 1 in one of these four elements. One of them. Uh, so... Let me just assume that this was a negative one. Uh, I don't know if that will break u and v, but let me uh, assume that this is negative one. That would be negative one and that would go to a zero. So that checks out, right? Uh, so I'm pretty sure I missed uh, a negative one in one of these elements. Um, and if I started doing the check with u, I think I can figure out which, which one of those elements uh, was supposed to be negative one. So there's a typo there. Uh, all right, questions here. How do you uh, how do you determine whether the set of vectors is an orthogonal set or not? You would have to check for all those three conditions, right? So all these three have to satisfy. Okay. Now, we are going to tie the two uh, concepts here of orthogonality and linear independence. So what we are going to prove is if a set of vectors is an orthogonal set, then the vectors in that set are going to be linearly independent with each other. Uh, so, and we'll prove this as well. So if, suppose you have an orthogonal set of non-zero vectors, that set is S and it has R vectors that belong to R to the N. If, there, if it is an orthogonal set, then each of those vectors is going to be linearly independent with each other. So what you have here is a linearly independent set of vectors. So let's try to prove that. 
And to prove this, what we are going to consider is uh, if you take uh, V1, V2, V3 and so on up to Vr and take any linear combination of those vectors, it should give you a zero, right? That's your linear equation. I'm setting up a linear equation with all these vectors. And if it is linearly independent set of vectors, then you know that the only solution to this for all the x values is going to be the trivial solution, which is x1 should be 0, x1, x2, all the x's should go to 0. So that's what we must show. If you take the linear combination of all these vectors, we know that they are orthogonal, right? So we know this, we know it's an orthogonal set. This guy is an orthogonal set. What we want to show is whether you have linear independence or not. So if it's an orthogonal set of vectors, uh, we have certain criteria. We know that the uh, dot product of one vector with any other vector should go to zero. So we know that. But what we are setting up as a proof is we are considering the uh, linear combination of all these vectors. So we need x1 amount, x2 amount of all these vectors. And if that goes to zero, we have set up a, a vector equation. And we are trying to show that the only solution to this is all the x's are zero. So only the trivial solution. Because if we have a non-trivial solution, then the set of vectors are linearly dependent. So since S is orthogonal, so we are going to consider this vector equation here. Uh, since S is orthogonal, we know that the dot product of uh, any vector with any other vector should go to zero. So I'm setting it up as V sub I transpose multiplied by V sub J should go to zero when I is not equal to J, right? That's my conditional of orthogonality I'm using. So it should uh, be okay for all the vectors in my set for, for J going from one to R, which I just need I to not equal J, right? So one with two and uh, two with three and so on, all the, all the different ones. So if that is the case, I'm gonna use this condition later on. I'll start with this, right? If I have this, I can multiply both sides by V transpose uh, jth vector in my set, the transpose of that, right? So I'm multiplying uh, both sides of my equation by v, j, v sub j transpose. And because I'm multiplying on the left side, I'm also going to multiply uh, all of these elements on the right side as well, right? So I'm multiplying this guy with v j transpose. So I should also multiply each of those elements with v j transpose as well. So what do what I have here is well, Vj transpose zero is just going to give me zero because I'm multiplying each element in the vector V sub j with a zero, which means when I multiply and add them up, I should get a zero. So that's that's okay. But what happens to the right hand side here? I know that Vj transpose uh, dot product with V1 is going to give me a zero because of the conditional of condition of orthogonality. So this one will go to zero, this one will go to zero, this one will go to zero. The only one that will be non-zero is when you have Vj transpose with Vj, right? So the only thing that will be left over is that guy over there and the coefficient of that will be x sub j, right? Now we know, so I, I should get the multiplication of these guys to go to a zero. And I know that Vj does not equal to zero. I need these guys to be non-zero vectors. So since Vj is non-zero, if I multiply these guys with xj, I should get zero. The only way that can happen is that coefficient xj is should be zero. And if j is anything between one and r, you can apply this condition for all j, one and r, which means that the whole set is going to be linearly independent. All the x's are going to be zero, which means you have a, only a trivial solution to that vector equation, which proves that you have a linearly independent set of vectors. So what we have proved here is, if you have a set of vectors that are belonging to an orthogonal set, then the vectors in that set will be linearly independent with each other. So if you have S as an orthogonal set of N non-zero vectors in R to the N, then it is going to, uh, then it is an orthogonal basis for R to the N. So it, it has all the linearly, so what we have here is linearly independent set of vectors in R to the N, which means that I should be able to span everything in R to the N, which means that that will be an orthogonal basis 
for r to the n. Those vectors will be my orthogonal basis. Uh, all right, let's move on here. Uh, orthonormal vectors. So orthogonal vectors, uh, you just need the dot product to go to zero. But orthonormal vectors should be orthogonal to each other, but also their norm should be one. Essentially, if you look at a vector in n-dimensional space, the distance from the origin to uh, th that point should, to any point, should be one, right? So the, the length of that vector should be one. That's your norm. And the way you define the norm of the vector u is simply taking u transpose u and taking the square root of that. So that's your distance from the origin. So you take, so you, if you assume that u is a vector here, which has u1, u2, and so on up to un, n elements, so it belongs to r to the n, what would be the norm of u? Norm of u will be square each element, add them up, take the square root. That would be the norm of that vector u. Now, how is this useful? Well, if you divide the vector elements by its norm, then what you get is a vector in the same direction with a norm of one. Let's take a look at that with this example. So here we have a vector here that belongs to r to the four Euclidean space. And if you find the norm of this vector, you are going to say, all right, it's going to be square root of nine plus 25 plus 16 plus one. That's the distance from the origin to that, uh, to that vector. Uh, and that'll give you square root of 51. That's, so the norm of this guy is going to be 51, uh, square root of 51. And if you divide each element, three, five, negative four and one, by that norm, one divided by the norm, what you get is the vector that points in the same direction, but has unit distance, right? Has a norm of one. Because you can take three divided by square root 51, and the second element would be five divided by square root 51 and so on. And you find the norm of that, you will get a one. So for uh, the qualification to be an orthonormal vector is orthogonal, uh, orthogonality has to be met, but also the norm has to equal one. And that's what we are defining over here. A set of vectors S, there are vectors here that belong to R to the N, is going to be considered orthonormal set of vectors if each pair of distinct vectors in this set is orthogonal with each other, and also they all have to have a norm of one. Now, this is pretty easy to, uh, so that what that means is, if you have an orthogonal set of vectors, it is pretty easy to find the corresponding orthogonal, orthonormal set of vectors, because you would take each vector in the set and you would divide it by their norms uh, and you, you, are, you have an orthonormal set of vectors now. Um, so an orthonormal set of vectors, we, we can take an example of uh, the, the unit vectors, right? So one zero zero in R to the N, in R to the three, you had one zero zero and zero one zero and zero one zero one. All of these are, uh, or that they belong to the orthonormal set of vectors. However, these are not the only orthonormal set of vectors. You can find other uh, orthonormal set of vectors in the same R cubed space. And we will show that later on. Um, in R square, like in two dimensional space, what do you have? X and Y axis. So a unit vector in X and a unit vector in Y, those will be your orthonormal set of vectors. Uh, let's see. Okay, so let's take an example of an orthonormal set. So you have U, V, W, three vectors. They all belong to R to the four space. This is going to be an orthogonal set. How do we know that? We are simply checking for, oh yeah, that's it. You see, this one was supposed to be negative one there. Yeah. All right, let me just fix that over there. Yeah. Earlier, this was a negative one. Negative one there. Uh, yeah, that's it. Okay. So if this is your orthogonal set of vectors, then we know that these three things will be met, right? u transpose v will be zero, 
u transpose w will be zero and v transpose w will also be zero, right? So that's uh, your orthogonal set. So if it, it needs this, right? And if you take them and you try to figure that out, dot product of each vector with any other vector, you will find that it is a one. Now, what I know is they are orthogonal, but they are not orthonormal vectors because you can clearly see what is the length of this guy? Well, it is the length of this guy is going to be square root three. Over here, I have some other number. I have some other number over here. They are not uh, orthonormal. So what I'm going to need to do is if I want an orthonormal vector that points in the same direction as u, I will take u and I will divide it by its norm. So square root of 51 over here, for v, I have square root of 4 plus 1 plus 1, so I've got square root of 6 there. And then for w, I have got a square root of 1 plus 1 plus 1, so I've got a square root of 3 over there, right? So using an orthogonal set, you can translate them into an orthonormal set by simply dividing each vector by their norms. So each vector's norm. Question here? So, you know, for, for you, for example, how did we write it for you? For you, the orthonormal uh, u, we wrote that as u was there and we divided it by its norm, right? Where the norm of u is simply u transpose u square root. And similarly, we did that for V and for W. Next, let's now start constructing or thinking about an orthonormal basis. So a basis is what? A compact representation of a subspace. So it has to be based on some criteria. And orthonormal basis would be all my basis vectors should be orthonormal vectors. So it should be an orthogonal set. They all have to have a norm of one. So let's consider B as my orthonormal basis. Uh, I have V1 all the way to VR over here. So I have R vectors in my basis. I, so I know that this is a basis uh, in, for a subspace W in R to the N. Now, if B is going to be uh, if B is an ortho, orthonormal set of vectors, then it is going to be considered as an ortho, orthonormal basis for W. So all of these guys should satisfy the conditions for being orthonormal set of vectors. Then the basis would be orthonormal for the same sub subspace W. A non-trivial subspace will have many different orthonormal uh, bases. So for example, if you consider uh, for R squared, right? For R squared space, what are the orthonormal bases? Well, you can have this. This is a unit vector, another unit vector. So this is a part of your identity matrix here. These uh, are one, zero, zero, one. So they, you know that they are linearly independent. They are orthogonal. They are also orthonormal. Their norms are one. However, but they are in line with your x-axis and y-axis, right? But you could definitely take the x-axis and y-axis and rotate it, right, by some angle. And if you rotate it, you will also get an ortho orthonormal set of vectors. You are keeping their distance same. You are keeping 90 degrees between those vectors and you can keep rotating it. And as you keep rotating it, you will get many, many different orthonormal bases, uh, which means that uh, basis is what? You will be able to span all of R squared using some linear combination of these vectors or these vectors or these vectors or these vectors and there'll be many more, right? So for example, over here, this is rotated version. This is also a rotated version. This is also a rotated version. Uh, so what, what are we getting here? One divided by square root two, one divided by square root two. That vector is, uh, so we have sort of rotated it by 45 degrees, right? If you take this vector and turn it 45 degrees, you get this vector. Um, another orthonormal set 
orthonormal set orthonormal set satisfying uh, the two criteria one orthogonal second um, what is that norm has to be a one so if you consider this particular set here uh, let me call them say v1 and v2 then if i check v1 transpose with v2 i will get a zero checking for orthogonality and also the norm of v1 will be a one and the norm of v2 will be a one right checking for uh both orthogonality and norm you know that this is going to be an orthonormal basis which means that if you want to go to anything in r2 r squared if you want to reach if you want to span r squared you can take some amount of v1 and some amount of v2 and get there um and v1 or v2 are linearly independent orthogonal orthonormal and so on and you can say that same thing about this guy and this guy as well uh, so where is this pointing this is you know this is pointing somewhere uh, you have one guy going uh negative one zero and then you have another guy going zero and one right so earlier it this guy was going uh some some this and this and then you rotated it by 45 degrees and then you rotated it even more uh, and you would get some other angle you will get that as well all right uh questions here for ortho orthonormal basis Okay, uh, let me move on here. Now let's talk about the coordinates in an orthonormal basis. So coordinates will tell you what? Coordinates will tell you how much of each basis vector do I need to go to any vector in my subspace, right? That's how we defined coordinates. How much of each vector do you need? So suppose you have an ortho orthonormal basis over here, which is B, B has uh, B is for R cube. It has three vectors. They are all in R cube. Now you have a U that belongs to R cubed, right? So if you have a U that belongs to R cubed, uh, can you reach U with some amount of this first vector in B, some amount of this second vector B, and some amount of this third vector B, right? Uh, so what we are trying to consider here is, let me let me go here. Uh, actually, before I do that, let me uh, call them something. Let me call this guy, this first guy, V1, V2, and V3, right? So B is a set of vectors. It has three vectors. They are all in R cubed. Um, and this is given to me as an orthonormal basis. So V1 is orthogonal with V2 and V3, and V2 is orthogonal with V3 all the norms are one, right? So I'm given that. Now, the question is, can I do this, right? Can I, after square, all right. So can I take uh, some amount, x1 amount? So can I take x1 amount of v1, and I, can I take x2 amount of v2, and I, can I take x3 amount of v3, and can I reach with this any vector u that also belongs to r cubed, right? So I need to figure out how much. And if I'm able to figure out how much of this, how much of this, how much of this, then what I have found is coordinates of that orthonormal basis to get to you, right? Uh, so let's see. Now what you can do is set it up as a set a system of linear equations, right? So since B is a basis for R cubed, now we can express U as a linear combination of vectors in B. So what you really have is, so essentially in this vector equation, you are saying x1 times we know v1 plus x2 times you know v2 plus x3 times you know v3 and you are given some u, right? u is 5, 3, 10. 
and let me just finish up the whole thing 0 0.6 0 0.8 and 0 negative 1 0 and then for 3 I had negative 0 0.8 0 and 0 0.6 right so you're setting it up as a system of linear equations over here so what you what will you get you will get uh, something like 0 0.6 x1 uh, plus 0 x2 minus 0 0.8 x3 equals 5 and then you'll get your second equation and you'll get your third equation you'll get system of linear equations three of them and with three unknowns what you can do is set it up as an augmented matrix and then do row reductions and so on so that's what we are doing over here to find how much of x1 and x2 x3 do we need so what we have here is that augmented matrix so we've got v1 v2 v3 and then we have also got u from here right and when you do the row reductions you will get something like this uh oh my gosh another typo here this was supposed to be a one uh, so row reductions will give you uh, your row reduced echelon form from this you know x3 is 2 x2 is negative 3 and x1 is 11 so you need 11 times v1 minus 3 times v2 plus 2 times v3 to get to that particular u in r cubed right uh, so 11, 3, negative 3 and 2 will be your coordinates. Let me just highlight those coordinates. 11, negative 3 and 2. Right. So those are the uh, amounts of each vectors I need to get to u. Now, clearly, uh, this involves a lot of work, right? So this involves you uh, to do uh, to form the augmented matrix, to do row reductions, and then look at the solution, uh, it, it involves a lot of work. However, there is a very easy way to find coordinates. Uh, all we need to do is project u onto each of these orthonormal basis vectors. And the projections will essentially give you the coordinates. So I'll project u on this one, and I'll project u on this one, and I'll project u on this one. Right? These three are orthogonal to each other. And their projections will simply give me the coordinates. So let's take a look at that. So what we found is u can be expressed as a linear combination of each of those uh, three orthonormal basis vectors. Uh, we, we already did. We call the basis vectors v1, v2, v3. Now notice that when you find the dot product of u with v1, uh, so I have u over here, u is 5, 3, 10, and you find the dot product of this guy with this guy, V1, you get 11, right? So you can see 5 times 0 0.6 plus 3 times 0 plus 10 times negative 0 0.8 will give you 11. And similarly, if you do, you transpose V2, project U onto V2, you're essentially finding the dot product of this guy with V2, what do you have? You have negative 3. And similarly for V3, you have 2 essentially giving you the coordinates in a very, very quick manner, right? So we, we don't need to do all that work of forming the augmented matrix, doing the row reductions, and then looking at the solution. All we need to do is project U onto each of the uh, orthonormal basis vectors, V1, V2, V3 in this case, and look at uh, the projection, the lengths there, 11, negative 3, and 2. Those will be your coordinates of the orthonormal basis. So we could simply find the coordinates by taking dot products with the basis vectors. Now, this will always work as long as we have orthonormal basis, right? So it, this is pretty important. This will work when you have orthonormal basis. And actually, even if you have an orthogonal basis, then you simply divide by uh, the, the norms of the vectors uh, and you get the, your ortho, orthonormal basis, right? So uh, you have a pretty straightforward path to finding the coordinates of an orthonormal basis, but also for orthogonal uh, basis of vectors as well, because all you need to do is divide each vector by their norms, right? So you would simply divide this guy by the norm of V1, right? And divide it by the norm of V2. If it was not orthonormal, and then you would divide by norm of v3. But in this case, the norms of each of these vectors is going to give me a 1. 
because they are all orthonormal vectors. So that's why I didn't have to do it here. Let me just erase that to avoid confusion because anyway, I'm going to be writing that later on as well. Uh, coordinates in an orthonormal basis. Uh, why does it work, right? That's essentially what we are trying to find it. Why does this work? We have done it as an example, but how does it work? How are we able to get away from all these row reduction steps? So let's try to uh, prove that. First state the theorem and then we'll prove it. So now we have a B, which is a set of R vectors and each of these vectors is in R to the N. They, this is an ortho, orthonormal basis. So we know conditions of orthogonality have to be met and also the uh, norms of each of those vectors have to be uh, uh, one. The, uh, the vectors are in subspace W belonging to R to the N and we are looking at some U that is also part of that same subspace W. Then I will be able to reach U as a linear combination of all these vectors in my orthonormal basis. All I need to do is project U on V1, project U on V2 and project U on VR. Those projections will essentially give me the coordinates. So again, I will do the same thing. I will highlight the word coordinates and I will highlight the coordinates. Right. Um, and I'm able to do this because this is an orthonormal basis in R to the N and it belongs to subspace W and U is also in subspace W. So I should be able to do this. I should be able to reach any point uh, and, and I will be able to, because the span, span of all these vectors should, because it is in uh, W, spans W, so you should, and we are assuming that U is also in W, then I should be able to express U as a linear combination of V1 through VR, where the linear combinations are given essentially by the coordinates, the projections on V1, V2, V3, and so on, of U. Now, let's try to prove this. Since B is a basis, uh, we can find the coordinates x1 through xr with forming a equation here. What are we saying? We can express u as a linear combination of all these vectors. Yes, we can do that because I said b is a set of vectors that spans w and u belongs to w. So I should be able to express u in this fashion. All I need to prove now is x1 equals this and x2 equals that and so on. xr equals that, right? Now I will use my conditions of orthogonality and norm being one. Since the basis is orthogonal and also orthonormal, here I'm using orthogonal. Since the basis of orthogonal, if I take the dot product of ith vector with j vector, where i is not equal to j, I should get a zero. That's checking for orthogonality. And also if I find the norm of any vector vj, I should get a one, so, right? So this is, this is another, another way of writing norm of vj should be equal to one, right? So vj transpose vj should give you one for all j. Now, using these two conditions, what I'll do is I will take this equation and I will multiply both of uh, both sides by vj transpose, right? Some vector that is belonging to this set, the transpose of that I'm multiplying throughout. So what, what do I get on the left side? I get on the left side Vj transpose u, but what do I get on the right side? I get Vj transpose this guy plus Vj transpose this guy plus and so on up to Vj transpose this guy, right? So all of these guys. And because x1 is a scalar, I can pull it up front and write it as x1 times Vj transpose times V1 plus and so on. Now, what are these going to be? I know that the orthogonality has to be met. So what do I get? Um, this guy goes to zero when j is not equal to one. This guy goes to zero when j is not equal to one. This guy goes uh, two. This guy goes to zero if j is not equal to r. The only thing that will not go to zero is one term right in the middle. What is that? It is going to be xj vj transpose vj, right? the dot product of vj with vj, that is the only thing that will not go to zero. Uh, but, I, but I also know that this, this is going to be one, right? This is one. So what you, you end up with is this equals xj, right? That's it. 
xj that's for all j right so what we what we said is xj is going to equal vj transpose u right now you can say xj is vj transpose u but also you can switch it around and say this is going to be u transpose vj right you multiply the dot product it doesn't matter um, because all you are doing is multiplying the elements and adding them up taking the square root so xj what did you find for that u transpose vj which means x1 what do you have x1 will be u transpose v1 uh, and then x2 will be u transpose v2 and so on proving this that's the reason why this works questions about this so coordinates in an ortho orthonormal basis all we need to do is take your vector in the subspace in this uh, example and prove we are considering u as that vector project it onto each of the vectors in my orthonormal basis the projections will give me the coordinates the projections are essentially uh, the dot products uh, let me move on here uh, there are no questions and uh, instead of orthonormal basis what if we had orthogonal basis? Well, you, there's a way to go from orthogonal to orthonormal. All we would need to is to divide by the norms of each of those vectors. So what we are writing over here is exactly the same thing as before, right? Exactly the same thing as before. But now what we are doing is dividing each of these vectors by uh, the norms of them, right? So U transpose V1 times V1 may not give you a orthonormal vector but if you divide it by v transpose v1 then you will get an orthonormal vector there so all we are doing is you are dividing by the norm of v1 here and norm of v2 here norm of v3 over here right just as i said earlier uh, you would need to divide by the norm of v1 there divide by norm of v2 there that's exactly what we are trying to do here if we were given an orthogonal basis instead of an orthonormal basis. Let us state that. If we have an orthogonal basis, then all we need to do is to divide by the norm of the appropriate basis vector to get the coefficients. So in this case, B is a set of R vectors. It is an orthogonal basis instead of orthonormal basis. It belongs to the subspace W in R to the N. U belongs to W, the same subspace. Then you can uh, find the coordinates of this orthogonal basis by projecting u on v1, by projecting u on v2, and so on up to projecting u on vr. However, I'm also going to need to divide because I'm going to need each of those vectors to be considered as orthonormal, right? So uh, earlier, my when I when I was just looking at v1, I had a orthonormal vector. I can make v1 now it is orthogonal vector so if i can if I, I want to make v1 orthonormal so i just simply divide by this and simply similarly for v2 i divide by this right so i, be, I have now the same equation but each of those vectors have been uh, made into a length of one the coordinates are still the same though coordinates are still the coefficients so it is uh, I need to figure out a good way of doing it. All of this guy is the coordinate. And so on. How much V1, how much V2, how much VR, right? All of them. Questions here. How do you find the coordinates of an orthonormal basis? And how do you find the coordinates of an orthogonal basis? Let's move on to projections. Another very, very important topic, irrespective of really what engineering major you are, right? So we keep talking about projecting vectors uh, onto a plane or from one uh, Euclidean space to the other. Let's talk about projections here. And we are essentially going to use the the similar, um, the, the, the concept of uh, 
projecting one vector onto like a plane involves finding the dot product. So let's say we have uh, W as our subspace and W actually spans uh, the space with these two vectors. So V1 and V2 are my basis vectors and the span of V1 and V2 is going to give me uh, W, right? So what this means is I can take some amount of V1 and some amount of V2 and reach anything in the subspace W. And now you have U. U is 2, 5 and negative 10 and it's actually not in, it is not in the subspace W. How do you, how can you verify that? Well, you can write U as a linear combination of V1 and V2, something like this. You can say uh, U equals X1 amount of V1 plus X2 amount of V2 and find X1 and X2. You will see that there is no solution that uh, this could have. So essentially what this means is I cannot reach U if I take any linear combination of these two these two vectors. So I, I don't have U in the subspace W. So what do you do then? Well, U can be expressed uniquely as a linear combination of the two orthogonal vectors, one in W and the one is that is orthogonal to W. So what we have here is two vectors, V1 here, V2 there, and the span of V1, V2 will be this plane, right? That has V1, that has V2, any linear, any linear combination of V1 and V2 will give you that span that is sort of highlighted over there, uh, shaded over there. Now, if you have U, another vector, and clearly this is not in the plane, this is popping out of the plane, how can I express U as a linear combination of two orthogonal vectors? What I'm going to do is I'm going to project U onto the subspace in W. And I'm also going to find what is uh, the projection of U to something that is orthogonal to W. So how can I project U onto this uh, in W? Well, all I would need to do is I would need to find, uh, let me use a big point here. Sorry. Let me highlight that with green, this guy right here. Right. And this point actually is going to be the closest to the vector U in W subspace. So if I have a vector here, I can project this vector onto the subspace, then I get a vector in the subspace, but I what now I need to find the other one, right? So I found this, I need to find this. How do I find that? Well, that is going to be whatever remains, right? So if you take U here, and if you subtract this projection, you get something that is going to be orthogonal to W because you can take this guy plus this guy and you can call this V1. So what, what I can do is I can use, say, I will use uh, U being written as the sum of two vectors, W1 and W2, right? And W1 is going to be in W, in subspace, in subspace cap W, right? Which is essentially what? The projection of U onto the subspace. Uh, so what I can say is W1 is actually equal to the projection of uh, U on what? On subspace uh, on the subspace W, which is what? Which is the span, span of two vectors, V1 and V2, right? So W1 is essentially, you see this? W, this is going to be a W1. Take U, the vector that is not in W, right? That's what we have here. Project it onto the subspace W, 
by finding the dot product of u with the, the subspace. So when you project that onto the span of v1, v2, which is w here, you get w1. And if you did u minus w1, you could get w2, right? What That's what whatever remains. Um, so this is w2 is going to be orthogonal to that plane. Uh -oh. Subspace w, right? So you get two vectors, one in w, the other one is going to be orthogonal to w. So we are we are calling it w1 and w2. Let me just name that. Uh, maybe in green I can go and name that w1 and w2. Uh, maybe I shouldn't write it over there. Maybe I'll write it here. So that I, you can see that it is not in the plane. It's popping uh, perpendicular to that plane. Um, so one vector is in w and one vector is orthogonal to w. So clearly there. Uh, it, they should be perpendicular to each other, right? So you can view these things as uh, uh, geometrically as well. Now, our question is, if you are given this u vector u, can you find the projection? And if you can find the projection, uh, then you can clearly subtract it from the original vector u to find whatever remains, w, right? Uh, so let's move on here. And then you, you can do this, you, you can be expressed as a linear combination. Uh, so, you know, let's do a very simple, instead of this, let me just do a simple one. So suppose you have an X and Y plane, right? So you have a vector here, uh, right? So how do you do with this? That vector is not on the X axis, it is not on the Y axis. So how can you express that vector as a sum of two vectors. Well, you project it onto the x-axis, right? You project it onto the x-axis and you also project it on the y-axis. Then you get two vectors, one here and one there. They are going to be both orthogonal to each other. So that's what we are trying to do here. If you have something that is not in the subspace, you can project it onto the subspace, one in the subspace, one orthogonal to the subspace and add them up to get to that u vector. All right, now we need to find the projection, right? So this guy, how do you get this? And how do you get this? Well, you just find the dot product of this guy with this, what is that going to be? Well, you can project it onto say one zero, right? Or you, for this, you can project it onto zero one, right? So if you have a orthonormal uh, vector, then you can project your u, this is was your u, onto orthonormal, uh, orthonormal vector one, orthonormal vector two, those projections uh, can be calculated by finding out the dot product there. So u transpose v1 will give you w1, u transpose v2 will give you w2, as long as v1 and v2 are orthonormal. If they're not orthonormal, then you would have to divide by their norms. That's what we are doing here. How do you calculate the projection? So suppose we have a W, that's your span. What is the span? Uh, w is your subspace. What is the subspace? It is span of the two vectors V1 and V2. So any linear combination of V1 and V2 will give me some vector in that belongs to the subspace W. You have your U, which is not in the subspace W, which is written over here. This is again, not in W. Because this, if this was in W, then you could take the linear combination uh, of V1 and V2 and be able to get those uh, values anyway, right? We don't need to project. This is for when the vector is not in that subspace. So because the basis of W is orthonormal, right? These guys are orthonormal vectors. So orthogonal to each other and their norms are one. The projection of U on to w can simply be found by finding the dot products just as we discussed so projection of u on to w right you see this projection of u on to the sp span right which is going to give me that so i'm essentially after w1 there how do you find that projection well you simply take you the u whatever you wanted project it on v1 
times v1. So you got the coordinate multiplied by the orthonormal vector plus the coordinate times the orthonormal vector. That will give you 2 times v1 minus 2 times v2. Where is this 2 coming from? Well, simply when you calculate u transpose v1, you know u. Uh, let me not do that. Uh, if you, you know u, find the dot product with v1, you get 2. And similarly, if you take u, find the dot product with v2, you get negative 2. So what you can say is, the projection of u onto w is a vector which is 2v1 minus 2v2, right? So if I go back here, if you did 2v1, you get there. You get 2v2, you get there, right? If you subtract them, that will give you the uh, projection of w onto the subspace. That's what this says. Uh, and it will clearly belong to that plane, right? Which is the span of v1 and v2. Now, because we know v1 and v2, you can substitute them over here and find the result. It's going to be that projection vector is going to be 2, negative 1.6 and negative 1.2. Now, you have the original vector u, you have the projection, which is in w. How can you find that is orthogonal to w? Well, just subtract them, right? So, you can do u minus the projection to get the vector that is orthogonal to the subspace w, right? So this is essentially going to be your w2, this guy. So if I come back here and use green and write this is w1 and this guy is going to be w2 because when you add them up, you get back w, right? Uh, sorry, th when you add them, you get u, the vector that you want to reach, this guy. So uh, if I want to find out what is orthogonal to the subspace, then I do u minus the projection I've got u from here, I've got the projection I just calculated, subtract them, I get this, right? So I've got w1 and w2 as two orthogonal set of vectors, and I can prove this. How can you prove that this is orthogonal to this? Well, just take w1 transpose w2 and check whether it is equal to zero or not. In other words, take the projection transpose and multiply it by u minus the projection, which is your orthogonal. And if that goes to zero, and it does for these two vectors, w1 and w2, it goes to zero. So now we know that these are going to give me two orthogonal vectors in w1 and w2. So what we have found is, if you have a set of basis vectors, and you want u to be able to be expressed as uh, sum of two orthogonal vectors, you can project u onto the subspace defined by a set of orthonormal basis vectors so that you can express u as a linear combination of two vectors. One is going to be in the span, the other is going to be perpendicular to that span. All right. Now, that was good. That was good for what? That was good for uh, something that has only two vectors, right? So when you have, say, two vectors, then you get a span, the span will be a plane, right? So you will get a 3D. Then you have U, then you can project. That will work for the case where you have two vectors. But what if the basis that you have has any number of vectors, V1, V2, V3, and so on up to Vr, then what do you do? The idea is simple. Take U, project it, onto uh, one subspace. Whatever remains, take that and do it on the second one. Whatever remains from that, take it on and put it uh, project it on to the third one and keep doing that until you reach to the last unit vector, uh, orthonormal vector. Let's do that over here. So finding the projections in general. So what do you do? Projections onto uh, subspace W, you can uh, can be calculated using dot products that are provided by the orthogonal basis for W. We have a theorem here, and the proof is going to be the similar one um, as we have seen before. So B is a set of R vectors, and this is an orthogonal basis, or not an orthonormal basis, but an orthogonal one. So we know that the dot product of any vector in, with any other vector should give me a zero. So, uh, and I'm able to span uh, W with 
these vectors any linear combination will get me all of this uh, subspace w belongs to r to the n so each of these vectors has n elements u also belongs to r to the n uh, however u is u is not in the subspace right so you see this is a little bit important here u is uh, not in span uh, uh, w the subspace u just belongs to r to the n then what you can do is you can you express u as u1 plus v2 u2 we use w1 plus w2 you can express that as u1 plus u2 where the projections of u onto w is what u1 can is projection of u onto the subspace w you are finding that out by simply projecting u onto v1 and you are dividing by the norm so that you get an orthonormal uh, vector for v1 there and you multiply by v1 similarly project u2 on v2 and the norm project u t u, uh, u on vr and the norm so u1 which is essentially your projection on to uh, w so which is what w1 in our previous example uh, last time what did we have we only had v1 and v2 now i'm saying what if we have r vectors well you would simply continue to do that for r vectors you would find dot products and you would divide by the norms uh, now once you get this projection u1 u is your original vector u1 is the projection so u2 is just this uh, whatever remains u minus u1 will be orthogonal to u1 right just as we had w2 to be orthogonal to w1 one is in the plane one is orthogonal to that plane the plane is span of v1 and v2 all right let's come back here okay so the proof follows the same ideas as the previous proof so uh, we are not going to uh, do the proof again uh, so all you need to do is uh, find the projections once you find the projections you will see how much of u do you need uh, using v1 how much of it you do you need using v2 and so on if you are starting with uh, v1 and so on up to vr as an orthogonal basis if this was orthonormal right if this guy was orthonormal then we wouldn't we wouldn't need to do these things right we wouldn't need to divide by the norms that's the only difference so let's try to do an example here um, so how do you construct an orthogonal basis this is the famous gram schmidt uh, procedure essentially the same idea if you have any vector in n dimensional space project keep projecting it onto uh, a basis of orthonormal vectors and as you project it, project it onto one then look at whatever remains right whatever remains take that and project it on the second one then whatever remains take it and project it on the third one and keep doing that until you run out of the number of uh, orthonormal vectors so the gram schmidt procedure starts with any basis s and this particular basis has vectors u1 u2 u so on up to ur uh, for a subspace w and we are trying to construct an orthogonal basis over here and we are calling that orthogonal basis by a different set of vectors b this vectors these vectors are v1 v2 v3 and so on up to vr so you have u1 through ur as any basis right it doesn't have any uh, criteria about orthogonality orthonormal nature nothing um, but b is uh, we are trying to construct right so given a basis can you make this basis into an orthogonal basis that's the question that we are trying to trying to answer given this you see this is not an ortho normal or orthogonal basis this is any basis right and it has r vectors there can you take r vectors that are not orthogonal to each other can can you construct provided they are in the same subspace can you construct an orthogonal basis b with 
the same R vectors for W, right? So any basis in subspace W has vectors that are not orthogonal to each other. Can you translate them into Vs so that you are still spanning the same subspace W, but now you are using orthogonal basis. So each vector here, right? So each vector here, uh, can I, can I can do R, VI transpose VJ will give me zero when I is not equal to J, right? That's the condition for orthogonality. But that condition is not met by U's. It's only met by V's. So how can you take U's and construct V's? That's the question that we are trying to answer here, constructing an orthogonal basis. And we are using this Gram-Schmidt procedure for that, which is a very systematic sort of step-by-step -step, uh, process. So let's take a look. We build uh, using the orthogonal basis one vector at a time. So try to find V1 first, then trying to find V2 next, then try to find V3 next and keep doing that. Right. So in, to initialize, what you do is you simply set u1 equal v1. That's how you initialize. Let my because there's nothing to be orthogonal to that. There's no limitation for that. So what I can do is when I'm starting things out, I can simply say the first vector in my orthogonal set is the same thing as my first vector in the any basis. So v1 is u1. Then what I do is at every step I modify or I simply rotate each vector in U like U2, U3, U1, so on up to UR. Each one I'm going to rotate to give V2, V3, VR so that two properties are met, right? So I'm taking U2, I'm rotating it to get V2. I'm taking U3, I'm rotating it to get V3 and so on. I'm taking UR, rotating it to get VR but as I am modifying, I am, uh, I, I will have to enforce two properties because at the end I need orthogonal set. What is that? If I'm working for uh, VJ, right? So suppose I'm working for, uh, I'm working, let, let me do it for V2, right? I, I, I already got V1. But if I was trying to find out what my V2 is, I'm going to make sure, well, not V2, let me make it three. If I was trying to go for V3, right? If I was trying to find V3, some rotated version of U3, I would have to enforce that until J minus one have to be orthogonal to each other. So in this case, V3 has to be found in such a way that V1 and V2 and V3, uh, sorry, V1 and V2 are orthogonal to each other, right? So for VJ, all the previous ones are orthogonal to each other and how about the span? Well, V1 through Vj minus one will not span the entire subspace W. But when you add one more Uj, whatever is remaining, then you will span all of, this, all of the subspace W. So these two conditions have to be met and that's how I'm going to find any vector V sub J. So geometrically what you're, what you're doing is this. Say suppose you have V1 over here, V2 over here, and there is a span of V1 and V2 that is uh, the plane highlighted. Uh, and let's suppose that we have this span to be the same as span of U1 and U2, right? So I'm just assuming that U1 and U2 are spanning the same thing as V1 and V2. But the thing that is going to be different is when I go for U3. So can, how can I find V3? So suppose I know U3 over here. I need to rotate U3 in such a way that I get V3 so that V1 will be perpendicular or orthogonal to V3 and V3 will be orthogonal to V2. Right? That, that's what I'm trying to, to find. So what I'll do is I will have U3, I will have a vector over here that is coming out of that plane and something that is parallel to the plane. Right. So this one is going to be, uh, let me do that in pink here. This one is going to be uh, parallel, parallel to span, uh, subspace. Uh, and then, well, let me just say span, span of u1, u2. And this guy will be orthogonal.
right so this is my orthogonal to the 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 the, the plane here and this guy is going to be parallel to that plane. So I've got two vectors that, that make up U3. Something that is perpendicular and something that is parallel. So what I'll do is perpendicular one is going to be what? Sub project U3 onto the span, uh, to onto the spa uh, space. How can I find the projection? I can do this, uh, maybe not this. Um, right project it so this will be giving projection that will give me whatever remains right i need whatever remains so project it subtract it from u3 i get v3 that's the idea all right let's take a look at that whole process with an example uh, so I'm going to start off with uh, U's that are a basis, but they are not an orthonormal basis. They are not even orthogonal basis. Uh, and I can quickly check whether they are orthogonal or not, right? So I can find, uh, let's check for U1 transpose U2. What will that give me? That will give me uh, 0 minus 1 minus 2, which is negative 3, which is not equal to 0. So that means that you can say, u1 and u2 are not orthogonal right but these are basis vectors how do i know you remember the example uh, from previous lecture where we had to find where we were trying to find basis for the range of a matrix a and we actually used three different methods to do it and in these those three methods we got three different bases one of those bases is this u1 and u2 so this this is a basis so using any linear combination of u1 and u2 i will be able to uh, reach any vector in the range of a i know that from the previous lecture but what i'm trying to find is you if you are given u1 and u2 as a basis can you tell me v1 and v2 that is also going to be uh, the basis for the range of A. However, V1 and V2 should be an ortho orthonormal uh, set of vectors, right? So let's do that. So our goal is to get an orthonormal basis for range of A. We found a basis for the range of A. We actually found three of them. Uh, what we are trying to find is an orthonormal basis for the range of A. So the same steps are going to carry over. First step is to initialize, uh, this should be V1. initialize v1 and we actually set v1 to be u1 right the first vector is the same as the first vector here because I, I have no condition over there conditions will develop as i move ahead for the second one and third one and they get more and more complex as you go on for more and more vectors but for the first one i can assume anything so i'll assume v1 to to be u1 so v1 is 1 negative 1 2 there's no condition for orthogonality yet, right? Uh, but if I wanted to make the norm 1, I would literally divide by square root of 6 uh, to make it orthonormal. Uh, I'm not doing that yet because I'm not going for an orthonormal basis. I'm just going for an orthogonal basis, basis uh, over here. Uh, so let's see. Uh, in two dimensions, why? Because my basis had two vectors for, for the range of A. So after I have set up v1 equal u1 now my goal is to find v2 right so i'm going to so this is from before i have those two basis vectors that are not orthogonal so so far i have got my uh, orthogonal set of vectors only has one vector so far v1 which i made equal to u1 now i'm uh, uh, trying to add my second vector um okay I am only going to get one more, right? Because I, uh, we, have, we, have, we know that to span, to be able to uh, span the range of the matrix, the basis may be different, but the number of vectors in the basis do not change. So if the number of vectors over here are two, I know that over here also are, they are going to be two, which is sort of the same reason why 
we had r vectors here we also had r vectors here the number of vectors in the basis will not change and we proved that in the previous class so now we need some v2 so can i rotate u2 such that i get v2 but the criteria is v2 should be uh, orthogonal to v1 right so but also i need it to be in the span of v1 and u2 right so based on this second property here i need vj to be in the span of all the previous v's and the new uj so i need v2 to be orthogonal to v1 but also it has to be in the span of v1 and u2 so if v2 has to be in the span of v1 and u2 then i should be able to express v2 as a linear combination of v1 and u2 which i'm doing over here i'm choosing v2 as some uh, u2 minus alpha v1 right so instead of saying uh, v2 is some x1 u2 uh, plus some x2 v1 i'm essentially dividing it uh, by x1 and it's i'm making this one and i'm making this x2 divided by x1 right so that, that is that is also going to be a linear combination uh, this is also going to be a linear combination except i have u2 minus some alpha v1 right so second vector in my ortho orthogonal basis can be found by taking u2 and subtracting alpha times v1 right u2 is your second vector you are subtracting what from it you are subtracting some scaled version of the previous vector from it right now alpha is going to be chosen based on a projection so all we need is uh, alpha is to be chosen such a way that my end my at the end i get the v2 such that v2 and v1 are going to be uh, orthogonal so this condition has to be met so v2 transpose v1 equal to 0 i can write that as 0 equals v1 transpose v2 and for v2 i can plug in u2 minus alpha v1 so i've got that v1 uh, transpose u2 minus alpha v1 transpose v1 transpose with this uh, i can pull out the alpha right so this is essentially saying zero equals all of this so i can pull out the alpha if which is going to equal v1 transpose u2 divided by v1 transpose v1 so what do we have here uh, take v1 project it onto u2 and divide it by the norm of v1 and you get alpha right so there is essentially a projection here uh, and this evaluates to a negative 1 and how do we know that it is a negative 1 well you just run through the numbers what is v1 transpose u2 v1 transpose u2 is going to equal this times this plus this times this plus this times this right so what do you have uh, 0 minus 1 uh, minus 2 so it goes negative 3 right uh, and then you have in the denominator v1 transpose uh, v1 so what is v1 transpose v1 this is essentially um, 1 plus 1 plus 4 right v1 transpose v1 equals 1 plus 1 plus 4 giving you 6 so you got negative 3 divided by 6 giving you half negative half So we are going to choose v2, some rotated version of u2 as u2 minus alpha times v1. vu2 I know from here, original basis. Alpha I have computed right now, negative half. And there was a minus there, so it became plus half. And then uh, v1, I've already set that to my uh, u1, so I know that as well. Plug in the matrices, find the result, you get half, half and zero. Now, let's quickly check whether V2 is going to be orthogonal to V1 or not. How do you check that? Simply find the dot product. V1 transpose V2. Does that go to 0 or not? You take V1 from here. You take V2 from here. Find the dot product. You will see that it goes to 0. So that's a very quick way of checking whether uh, things are orthogonal to uh, each other or not. So what we have at the end is an orthogonal basis B 
that was constructed for the same thing, for the same range of A. Earlier we had a basis, now we have an orthogonal basis. So both these vectors are still basis for the range of A, the same A, but U1 and U2 were not orthogonal, V1 and V2 are an orthogonal uh, basis uh, set of vectors, orthogonal set of basis vectors. And dimension is 2 uh, over here as well. The number of uh, basis vectors do not change. Okay, so, you know, if you expand this out to a more general case, you see what is going to happen. V3 is going to be U3 minus the projection on V1 and the projection on V2, right? So you just subtract whatever you had already done from the new vector to get V3 and V4 and V5 and so on. And we'll take a look at an example later on. Uh, now, all of this was for orthogonal. Again, when you go for orthonormal, all you would do is divide, right? If you want to make this into an orthonormal basis, all you would do is uh, divide it by square root of 6 over here and divide it by uh, what do you have here? 1 fourth, 1 fourth, uh, 1 eighth. Uh, you're dividing it. So 2 square root 2, right? So you would simply multiply over here by 2 square root 2. So if you multiply here by these two factors, you would have made them an orthonormal uh, set of basis vectors. We don't need to do that over here because we are just after an orthogonal basis. Let's move on here. Okay, so Gram-Schmidt iteration as a projection. So this is for the general case. Now to calculate any vector V sub J that belongs to the orthogonal set of vectors, all you need to do is calculate a working vector w, the projection of uj onto the span of all the previous vectors. And since these uh, are orthogonal, you can find the projection as this. So uh, we can actually take a look at this uh, with, with, a, with a graph here. So let me uh, add uh, a page and let's try to take a look at what, what we are actually doing in terms of uh, a, like a geometric interpretation of this. So let me start off with uh, some, uh, yeah, uh, this is some span here. Uh, let me say this is uh, span, this is my subspace, which is the span of V1, V2, and so on up to Vj minus 1, right? Th that's my span. Um, and I'm trying to find the projections for, I'm trying to find Vj. And right now I have uj, right? Uh, I need to rotate uj. Uh, so let me in, in blue sketch uj, which is somewhere here, which is not uh, a part of the plane. This is some uh, uj, uj. I need to find vj. So some rotated version of uj I need to find. What am I going to do? I'm going to project uj onto my span. So when I do that, I'm going to get uh, two things here. Let me draw them in. Uh, sure, maybe I can use that. So I get two things. One is here. And then the other one will be here, right? And similarly, I can say this one is here and here. So the blue guy is over there. Now, what about the, the gray ones here? This is going to be a projection, right? So about this, I can say this guy is going to be projection uh, of what on what of uj onto the span. So uh, I'm, I'm saying span of all of these, right? So I'm projecting uj onto the span and I get that vector over here. What I need is vj. vj is what? Whatever remains, right? So let me highlight this. 
and maybe color code this one and I can do that for this guy as well VJ is going to be right here now for VJ uh, what what uh, what do I need VJ is simply going to be UJ minus that projection right so I can say VJ is going to be take start with UJ and you subtract your projection of UJ onto the previously obtained span and this particular thing you are growing every vector right every step you are adding one more vector to the span from at the beginning you have one vector in that span v1 then you add v2 then you add v3 when you are working for uj then you you have you would have added until u, vj minus 1 so if you want vj take your uj like u3 if you want v3 take u3 subtract the projection of u3 onto the span that is between v1 and v2 right you, you, you see that so that's how you would get vj um, and of course these are perpendicular so I can also say this is 90 degrees there that is 90 degrees there and that's it All right let me go back here oh I added two slides alright so to calculate vj any vector j in my orthogonal set of vectors i have this vector w this is my w right this is my w equals w the the projection is my w that working vector w the project which is the projection of uj onto the span of all the previously obtained vectors v1 through vj minus 1 since these vectors are orthogonal you can find the projection by simply taking uh, uj project it onto v1 uj project it onto v2 and so on up to uj project it on j minus 1 right so take uj project it on each of these vectors you are going to be able to get to w right that's what we did over here you took uj you projected it onto the span you got your w once you have your w uj minus w will give you your vj right that's what your vj is uj minus w so um, you are calculating vj by subtracting the given vector u from w and the way you are finding w which is the uh, projection of uj onto the span of all the previously uh, obtained vectors the, the way you are calculating that is by projecting it onto that span so this calculates part of uj that is orthogonal to the subspace that is spanned by all these vectors so which is which is our green line over here it is perpendicular to that plane that is spanned by v1 through vj minus 1 all right, uh, let's take a look at that with some numbers. Let's say that you have an initial basis with a dimension of three. You have three vectors, u1, u2, u3, and they're supposed to be not orthogonal to each other. If they are, then our problem is done right away. Um, let us check whether they are orthogonal to each other or not. How about v1, u1 and u2? Uh, so zero there, one there, zero there, zero there, right? So you got a one there which is not equal to zero. So right away you know that u1 and u2 are not orthogonal to each other. Um, and the same applies for u3, u, u2 and u3. Zero plus zero plus zero plus one. You got a non-zero number there. So again, u2 and u3 are not orthogonal. Uh, so you have a set of three vectors. Uh, each of the vector uh, is in R to the four space. And we are trying to find the ortho, uh, orthogonal basis for the span of S. Right, so we want to come up with some v1, v2, v3, so that we can still span the same subspace, but all the v's should be orthogonal to each other. And we are doing that by using this systematic Gram-Schmidt procedure. Project, subtract, project, subtract, project, subtract. 
So what do you do? Initialize for v1, there's no constraint. So v1 equals u1. So we have made v1 equal to that. How do you calculate v2? Well, v2 is going to be, I'm just using this formula here, right? uj minus w. Uh, so vj or v2 is going to be u2 minus whatever you are going to project onto v1, right? So we know uh, u2 from here. We know v1 from here, which is same as u1. Uh, u2, again, we know that. v1, you know that. v1, you know that. v1, you know that. You can plug in all those numbers and uh, do the calculation to get v2. So v2, v2 is going to be perpendicular to the span in which you have v1. So uh, you've got your v2. You've got v1, you've got v2. Of course, we need v3 because you are going to have three basis vectors even in the orthogonal set of vectors. How do you find v3? Well, v3 is going to be u3 minus w, which is going to be your projection on whatever you did for v1 and whatever you did for v2, right? So uh, project u3 onto v1, project u3 onto v2, uh, and all of that subtracted from u3. And you know u3, v1, v2, you, all, you know all of those vectors, substitute them to find your v3. You have got your sec third vector in the orthogonal set. So what we have is v1, v2, and v3. These are three orthogonal. Uh, in fact, they are orthonormal, right? So you have uh, actually are they orthonormal? No, they are not orthonormal. Um, one, plus one, plus four, square root six. It's half, so it's not orthonormal. Uh, all we got is uh, an orthogonal basis. Um, so three vectors that have uh, the same, that are spanning the same subspace S, but they are now orthogonal to each other. And you can check that. You can, how can you check that? You can check whether the basis B is orthogonal or not. B is your orthogonal version, S was your non-orthogonal version. So the way you can check that is uh, simply by taking V1 and doing it with V2 and so on, right? So you can say, v1 transpose with v2 does that go to zero or not right uh, similarly you can do v2 transpose with v3 does that go to zero or not and v1 transpose v3 does that go to zero or not right and they they will right so that's the way you would check uh, whether uh, they are going to zero or not so that that's the way you would check whether b is an orthogonal set of vectors or not Next, I also want to check whether each vector in S is in the span of B, right? Now I said there is a span of S, but span of S in any vector in the span of S, will I be able to reach by using a span of B? And I will check this by uh, considering, now I will check that over here. By assuming that some u3 is in the span of b, then I should be able to write u3 as a linear combination of v1, v2, v3, where the the the, the linear combination is essentially given be given to me by my coordinates, right? So I should be able to say uh, u3, which is 0, 0, 1, 1, uh, is it the same thing as, uh, which is, this is u3. Sum uh, x1, v1, plus x2, v2, plus x3, v3. Can I get u3? Where x1 is u3 transpose the coordinate uh, v1 divided by v1 transpose v1 and similarly for x2 is going to be uh, u3 transpose v2 divided by v2 transpose v2 and then for x3 you have u3 transpose v3 divided by 
V3 transpose V3, right? Uh, and if you plug in the numbers for uh, U3 transpose, um, U3, V1, V2, V3, you will see that this goes to exactly 0, 0, 1, 1. So this checks that whatever you are able to span with S, you are also able to span with uh, uh, the V1, V2, V3, the span of V. So this checks out there. Uh, let's see. I have wanted to do an example here. Uh, let's see if I can do this. Okay, so we are running a little bit short on time. Uh, let's see. Rescaling our orthogonal basis. So let's suppose that we wanted a orthonormal basis. How would you construct an orthonormal basis? Sub and we have you have already gone to tilde of B, which is orthogonal basis, right? You have got got V one, V two, V three. You started with U's, you went to V's. So you started with a basis, you went to orthogonal basis. How can you make it into an orthonormal basis? All you would need to do is normalize them by their uh, norms, right? So you would divide V1 by the norm of V1, divide V2 by the norm of V2, divide V3 by the norm of V3, and you would get that. Uh, so here you have norm of V1 will be square root of 1 plus 1, square root of 2, right there. V V2, you will have 1 plus 1 plus 4, square root of 6. Uh, 1 plus 1 plus 9 plus 1 square root of 12. So you are essentially dividing each of these vectors, orthogonal vectors, with their norms to get to an orthonormal basis. So, so with this, right, what I'm hoping is if you are given any, uh, let's see, if I go back, the whole goal is if you are given a set of vectors in a basis that was, that was not an orthogonal basis, could you construct an orthonormal basis for that or not, right? So you would go for orthogonal, then you would make it into orthonormal, right? That, that's the whole procedure over here. Um, and you sort of, sort of a main, main formula here, which is, which is this guy, right? So this will give you the projections. And all you're doing with those projections is subtracting it from the UJs to get the VJs. Uh, so that's an iterative uh, procedure to get that uh, let's see all right I think that was the last slide that I had all right so I'll stop here uh, that is all I had for you guys uh, for today's lecture now uh, in the next one we'll talk start talking about eigenfunctions and eigenvalues so I'll stop recording